Hi, everybody. This is the lecture to accompany Chapter 8 in your textbook. Please read Chapter 8 very carefully, as there are a lot of things that I simply don't have time to talk about in this lecture. Okay, let's talk about emotion. Emotions are your body's multidimensional response to any event that either enhances or inhibits your goals. Multidimensional means that there are different aspects to emotion. There are physiological aspects, that's what's happening with your body. Mental aspects, what's happening in your brain. Behavioral aspects, how you react behaviorally to an emotion. There are also social and cultural aspects, and I will be discussing those later in this lecture. Emotions are responses or reactions to things that happen to you or that happen around you, and that is your response. Emotions are not moods. Moods tend to hang on for a while, and sometimes you really can't tell why you are feeling a particular mood. However, emotions are short-lived. You experience it, and then it goes away, although you can call it back up later. But most emotions have an identifiable cause because they are reactions. The textbook categorizes emotion into three separate types. Joyful and affectionate, what we consider to be positive emotions, and then hostile and sad and anxious. So let's take a look at those different categories. The joyful and affectionate emotions include happiness. Now happiness is the most universally recognized emotion. Happiness is a state of contentment, joy, pleasure, and cheer. And all over the world, people respond to happiness by smiling, laughing, being energetic. There's something about happiness that makes you want to share it. For example, I was sitting in my office when I got the call several years ago that said that I had been accepted for a tenure track position at the college. I was so excited. I jumped up. I ran out into the hallway looking for somebody I could tell. Nobody that I knew was around, but this other faculty member was sitting in her office, and I didn't even know her, but I just had to tell somebody. So I told her. She got up, gave me a hug. Uh, we had a wonderful moment there, all because I shared my happiness with her. And that's something that happens a lot. Then we have love and passion. And love and passion uh, is sometimes easier to recognize than to define it. And one reason for that is we experience a lot of different forms of love. There is that bonding and commitment to the people in our family, parents, children, relatives. We also can love our friends, people who we have a deep abiding friendship with and want to be friends with them forever. And then, of course, when we think of love, particularly passion, we think of sexual attraction and intimacy and that bonding to another person and the desire to commit to them. And then, of course, you've got the ultimate love that uh, we have for humankind. If you are religious, you believe in God, life itself, the universe, those kinds of things. And then there's the emotion of liking. And liking is not a strong as love, but certainly very positive feelings. We like someone or something, we have good feelings for it and a preference for it, but it doesn't go as far as we bond with that person or have a deep commitment to them. However, there are some people that we actually love, but we don't particularly like them. And if you think about it, maybe, you know, someone in your family or a person who you have a good friendship with, but they tend to do some things that you don't particularly like. So loving and liking, you don't have to do that with the same person. Then we have the hostile emotions, and we consider these to be negative. However, they are definitely a part of humanity, so it's good to understand them and why they occur. The different hostile emotions include anger, and anger is our response to either being or at least perceiving that we have been wronged in some way. And anger can go on a scale from simple annoyance all the way up to outrage. 
Then we have contempt. Contempt can be a very devastating emotion in an interpersonal relationship because in contempt, you feel superior to another person. And because of that, it can tend to lead to insults and belittling that other person. Then there is disgust. Disgust is revulsion that happens when we are confronted with something or someone who is repellent or offensive to us. Then we have jealousy. Now, jealousy and envy are both included in hostile emotions. People tend to confuse those two emotions, but they are different. Jealousy is that feeling that you get when you believe that a relationship that means something to you is threatened by a third party. So that is definitely an interpersonal kind of emotion. Whereas envy, basically we want what someone else has. Now, envy can actually be a good motivator because if you look at someone and go, I want what that person has, well, maybe you can go out and work to get what that person has. But obviously, it can also cause a great deal of harm if because you want what that person has, you just take it from them. So envy has a good side, but also a bad side. Then we have what are called the sad or anxious emotions including sadness, and we've all felt sad occasionally. And that is basically the opposite of happiness, where we are unhappy, we feel sorrow, or we feel discouraged. Sadness is a reaction to loss somehow, as the positive emotions are a reaction to something good happening in our life. Sadness and anxious emotions are a reaction to something that we believe is getting in our way or causing us harm. So sadness is unhappy, sorrowful, or discouraged. Depression is a form of sadness actually is a medically diagnosed physical illness, typically lasting far longer than sadness. So if your sadness is continual, it is highly likely that you are depressed and uh, you should possibly see somebody about that. Then we have grief. Grief is profound sadness, extreme sadness due to loss of something or someone that meant a great deal to us. And there are five stages that people tend to go through in grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Now it can take several years to go through all these five stages. And sometimes people go back and forth between these stages before they finally get to the acceptance stage. Then there is fear. Now, fear is an emotion that is a reaction to some kind of perceived or real danger. I don't know if you've heard of the fight, freeze, flight response, but that is what happens to our bodies. We can either fight, a reaction to a danger may make us stand up and punch somebody in the face, or freeze, in other words, we become immobile and unable to do anything, or flight, in which we run very quickly away from what we perceive to be the danger. And finally, social anxiety, which is a kind of fear, but this fear is specific to feeling that we may be perceived negatively by other people. All right, I said I was going to talk about how emotions are multidimensional. So yes, they are. Emotions are physiological. Physiological has to do with what happens to your body when you feel an emotion. Different emotions may cause similar reactions. Think about fear, excitement, and passion. Those three are completely different emotions, but things are happening in your body that may be similar. Your heart races when you're afraid. It also races when you're in a passionate moment. Most of the time, it's because of our cognitive components of emotion that we know the difference between those things. So cognitive has to do with what is going on in our brains. Our brains label what's going on, and we can tell the difference between 
passion and fear and excitement because we understand what's going along with those particular emotions. So we don't get them confused with each other. Then emotions are behavioral. There is something called action tendencies, and these are specific behaviors that an emotion motivates us to engage in. Now, tendency means that is our natural impulse or instinct to do based on an emotion, but it doesn't mean that we have to do them. If someone makes you angry, your action tendency may be to punch them in the nose, but just because that might be the action tendency that is an impulse does not mean that you have to act on that impulse. And finally, emotions are social and cultural. Particular responses are often shaped by our society's beliefs about particular situations. For instance, certain cultures are okay with eating particular kinds of food, maybe a particular kind of animal that we in American culture might find absolutely disgusting or horrendous. And there are other societies, such as Indian society, where they consider the cow to be a sacred animal, and they just cannot believe that we would do anything as horrendous as eating a hamburger. They would find that disgusting. We don't find it disgusting. So as you can see, the social and cultural component of an emotion may indeed be due to a particular culture's beliefs. Emotions also vary in valence and intensity. Valence is an emotion's positivity or negativity. The more positively we view a particular emotion, the more positive its valence on the valence scale. Happiness, joy, love, passion, all those things have high positive valence. All the way down to the bottom with negative valence would be things like disgust, fear, anger, hate, and grief. That is an emotion's valence. An emotion's intensity is its strength or magnitude. Each individual emotion may indeed come in different forms. So you can see anxiety, worry, and terror are all forms of fear, where anxiety might be a mild form of fear. You just feel a little bit anxious. When you start to get a little more anxious, then it kind of passes over into worry, which would be a moderate form of fear. And if that keeps going and you fear for your life, then that would qualify as terror, which is an extreme form of fear. Emotions come in both primary and secondary emotions. The primary emotions are distinct emotional experiences that tend to be expressed and understood the same way across the world. The primary emotions have been determined to be joy, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. And when people see images of other people who are expressing those emotions across the world, people can pick out and identify the emotion that that person is illustrating. So these are called primary emotions. Now there are also secondary emotions, combinations of other emotions. Jealousy, for instance, we already talked about jealousy. Jealousy is an emotion that is a combination of fear, sadness, and anger. Think about it. When you're jealous of another person because you think that they are going to take your friend or lover away from you, there is fear, there is anger, and there is sadness. And so jealousy is a combination of those. And so secondary emotions are composed of combinations of those six primary emotions that I just talked about. Sometimes emotions are meta-emotions. Remember the term meta means about. So these are emotions about emotions. So think about it. Emotions can be layered like this. Maybe when you realize you're jealous that your friend also has another friend who she says is a very good friend and you're jealous of that other person, then you recognize that jealousy and you might be a little embarrassed by that. 
culture can also affect emotion. People from northern climates, colder climates, actually are less emotionally expressive. In other words, they don't express their emotions. They still feel them, but they don't express them as much as people from Mediterranean or warmer climates. Isn't that interesting? Also, co-cultures differ in emotional behavior. Think about it. Theater people, people who are actors, are very emotionally expressive, but maybe people in the military or um, security, those kinds of things, they are taught to keep their emotional behavior in check. So they might be less likely to go seek help for depression or anything like that because they're not supposed to feel those kinds of things. There are a lot of things that go into our display of emotion. There's something called display rules, and these are unwritten rules that govern the ways people manage and express their emotions. So these five ways of expressing emotions are things that we do generally to cover up how we are really feeling, because sometimes it's just not appropriate or we feel it's not appropriate in particular circumstances to display what we are really thinking and feeling. So we might use one of these display rules. The first one is intensification, and that's exaggerating an emotion to make it appear more strong than you feel it. Maybe somebody's really, really excited about something that happened to them, and you're not particularly excited. I mean, you're happy for them, but you're not overly excited. But to make them feel better, you might act like you're more excited than you feel about that particular thing. Then there's de-intensification. That's the opposite of intensification. That is downplaying an emotion to make it seem less strong than you feel it. So you might be angry about something, but in the situation, letting out your anger may not be the best thing to do. Uh, so you downplay it to make it seem like you're just kind of annoyed when you really are much more angry than that. Then there is simulation, and this is acting as if you are feeling emotion that you're actually not feeling. So if somebody has good or bad news and you really don't care, so you have no feeling about it at all, but acting like you feel something about this might be more appropriate than you might do what's called simulation. So you're simulating an emotion that you don't have. Inhibition is the opposite of simulation, and that's acting as if you are not feeling an emotion that you are feeling. Maybe you're in a situation where you're very, very nervous or anxious. The fear is kicking in, but you know that you can't act as if you are fearful in a particular situation, so you act as though you are not afraid. That is inhibition. And finally, masking. And masking is interesting. That is expressing one emotion when you are actually feeling a different one. So, for instance, let's say that you and your friend were up for the same promotion at work. Your friend got it and you didn't. Your friend is very, very excited. You are very, very depressed and sad and maybe a little bit angry that you didn't get it. But in the circumstance, you need to portray excitement and happiness for your friend when you are feeling the exact opposite. So you can see how we utilize these display rules in our interpersonal communication. Most of the time, it is to make somebody else feel better or to hide what we are actually feeling. Even technology affects our ability and the way in which we express emotion. One of the problems with technology, and here I'm talking about text, messages, emails, those kinds of things, where there are not as many channels of communication, is that there is a lack of nonverbal signals. So you can't see somebody's face, so you may not be able to determine somebody else's emotion in a text or email. Now we have emoticons or people typing just kidding or explaining how they feel, which can help to alleviate that, but just in and of 
itself, it can get in the way of determining what emotion is in play in this interaction. However, technology does give us the opportunity for sharing our emotion, particularly social media, allows us to find our friends and talk to them and share how we are feeling at any given moment. We do have the ability to express emotion on social media. We may even have emotion about technology itself. Of course, you may love your smartphone, your laptop, and your video games, and then when they break or you drop them, then you hate them. So you can have feelings about your technology. And there is something called emotional contagion. These emotions that we feel and express influence not only us, they can affect the people around us. And this is called emotional contagion, and it involves the tendency to mimic and maybe even feel the experiences and expressions of other people. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you're in a group of people and one person is particularly unhappy, it kind of brings everybody else down. Or one person is experiencing something very positive and it brings everybody else up. So we have a tendency to relate to the feelings of the people around us. And that can occur in face-to-face, -face, but it also occurs in online settings. I don't know if you read the comment sections of articles online or or even on Facebook, when somebody starts talking about a particular topic that brings up emotions and then everybody jumps in and people get angry at each other, it certainly happens in political years, that's true. So as you can see, this contagion can be negative. It can also be very, very positive. It depends on the emotions that are being expressed. Sex and gender plays a role in how we experience and express emotion. When I talk about experiencing it, we all experience emotions, no matter our gender. Indeed, we may feel particular emotions maybe a little bit stronger than other people, and we certainly express them differently based on our gender. Androgynous people. Androgynous people are those who have both male and female characteristics and qualities. Those people tend to be more emotionally expressive than people who consider themselves highly masculine individuals. Because traditionally masculine people, particularly in our culture, tend not to express emotions because they feel that makes them too vulnerable. And so people who report very, very masculine tendencies show less emotion. Jealousy is apparently experienced just a little bit differently between men and women, although men and women both feel jealousy. But it's been shown that men are more likely to experience sexual jealousy. In other words, they are jealous of the physical interaction that their significant partner might have with some other person. Whereas women are more likely to be jealous of an emotional bond that their partner has with somebody else. It's also very interesting that men are more likely to report feeling hostile emotions than women, but women are more likely to report feeling sad. Women are more likely to express both positive and sad emotions than men. There are a couple of personality dimensions that affect how you experience emotion. There's something called the Big Five Personality Test, which if you just type it into a browser, it will bring up several tests that you can take that test these three dimensions and a couple more that can tell you why you either feel particular kinds of emotions. Anyway, it's really, really interesting. So if you are curious about that, I recommend that you do it. Anyway, these dimensions are agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. Now, agreeableness means that you tend to be pleasant, accommodating, and generally report being happier. And people who score high on agreeableness tend to be better at managing their emotions and any stress in their life, they can manage that 
a little bit better as well. Then there are extroverts, and extroversion means that you are more sociable and outgoing. So people who score higher on the extroversion scale tend to focus more on positive aspects of others because they are outwardly focused. So they're looking at other people and because they are sociable, they tend to think better of other people and that influences the emotions that they have. Then there is neuroticism and neuroticism is the tendency that people have to think negative thoughts. So if you score high on the neuroticism scale, that means that you're more likely to experience negative emotions. These three things can definitely influence the way that you feel emotion and how you express it. There is something called emotional intelligence or EQ. EQ is the ability to perceive and express emotion. People with high EQ tend to use emotion to facilitate their thought and their emotional growth. There are some studies that have found that emotional intelligence is an asset, not only in personal relationships, but also in business. There's actually a quiz on page 268 of chapter 8 that you may be interested in taking because it helps you to determine how emotionally intelligent you are. There is one condition that inhibits emotional intelligence, and that is alexithymia. Alexithymia is a condition that's characterized by the inability to understand, process, and describe emotions, not only one's own emotions, but the emotions of the people around them. Um, you know, if you happen to have it, it makes it far more difficult to have effective interpersonal relationships because you really can't tell what somebody else is feeling. Just like all the other communication behaviors we've been talking about over the past weeks, we can manage the expression of our emotions one of the things that we need to do is be able to clearly identify what emotions that we are feeling. Listen to your body. Your emotions have a physiological component. So what is your body telling you in a given situation when you're having a response? So pay attention to what your body's saying. Also pay attention to your thoughts. This is the cognitive part. What is going through your mind? Remember that your mind can help you to determine what your body is feeling when it comes to emotion. Take stock of the situation. Remember that an emotion is a response to perceived or real event that either inhibits you, and that's where the negative emotions come in, or enhances your goal. Understanding what emotions do to your body and your brain is going to help you be able to identify them. And finally, stop and think. Learn to reappraise negative emotions. Emotional reappraisal involves changing the way that you think about a particular situation that gave rise to the negative emotion. So let's say you got a really bad grade on a test. Well, you could be angry, you could be depressed, those are the natural emotions, but maybe reappraising that may make you realize that this is an opportunity to learn more about this particular thing and maybe do better on the next test. And so you're reappraising that and thinking of it in a not so negative light. Accept responsibility for your own emotions. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the difference between I statements versus you statements. Your emotions come from inside you. Yes, they are a response to something that happened outside of yourself. Nevertheless, they belong to you. So rather than saying, you make me so angry, it's much more responsible on your part for you to say, I'm very angry about this. That puts the responsibility for the anger on you and not on the other person. Finally, separate your emotions from your actions. Remember that action tendencies are just that. They are tendencies. Just because you may want to do something or it may be an impulse on your part to do something based on an emotion, you don't necessarily need to act based on an emotion. 
you can think about it, you may decide to do something else instead. So identifying and being able to tell what emotions that you're feeling, accepting responsibility for those emotions, and realizing that action tendencies are simply tendencies. These are all skills that you can learn to better yourself. And the more you practice these skills, the better you're going to be at managing your emotional communication. This is the end of the lecture to accompany chapter eight.